There's sure a lot on people's minds right now out here. And the Lord gave me a message for today. As I think about it, you cannot divorce yourself from where you live on what's going on around you. It'll affect you in some ways. Now, it doesn't have to bring you down. It doesn't have to steal your joy. It doesn't have to do any of that. But it is real. And there's turmoil in this country, and there's a reason for it, because there's been a lot of things going on in this land for the last 40 years that God's not happy about. And one thing about the Lord is he always talks about how long-suffering he is with anybody, with any nation. And God has men in every generation that will speak to these things, and they'll, they'll raise their voice and say, God's given you a chance to change course. He's given you a chance to do something about it. Look at, look at Jonah. <laughs> look at what he went through, trying to get away from having to take a message somewhere to tell a nation to repent. I mean, he thought he had a good escape route planned, and the Lord found a way to get him back there. All it took was a hurricane, a shipwreck, being thrown overboard, a whale getting him out of the ocean and spitting him up on the shore, and him realizing, you know, I don't think I'm getting away from this. i got to go tell him. And that may seem kind of an outrageous way for God to do it, but God does that because He loves mankind. He loves people, and mercy always rejoices against judgment with Him. He's always more interested in people coming back and doing the right thing than He is having to pass judgment on them for doing the wrong thing. That's just the nature of God. You can't get away from that. The Word says God is love, and He is love. He loves man. He doesn't like to judge man. He didn't make man for He didn't make hell for man. He made it for the devil and his angels. It was never his intention. And so all this turmoil in the land right now, and God's looking to see which way do they want to go. And you know, it's sometimes you raise your voice Men raise their voices, a decision is placed before them, and they don't always do the right thing. But I thank God that He always has an answer. And He always holds out something for His people, because the people of God live in a different kingdom than the ones on this earth. Now, like I said, we are affected by it. It's around us. It's the environment that we operate in. But it cannot take away from us what God has given us. And that's why the, the title of the message that he gave me is very simple. How beautiful Satan's trying to trouble the waters here in this land. That's what he's trying to do. He likes turmoil. He also likes it when people continue in things that God is warning them against. And he likes to rear his head at times like this and trouble people. And it can lead to some real turmoil. We've seen all this year long, we've seen the turmoil in this land. And yet Isaiah prophesied back Chapter 52 of Isaiah, he said, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. The watchman will lift up the voice with the voice together shall they sing. You realize when God begins to speak in this earth and His watchmen begin to speak, it says they'll lift up the voice together. There won't be a disunity in God's church. This world can have all the turmoil it wants. 
But in God's kingdom, when He starts to raise up His watchmen to speak and decree and declare over this land, they raise one voice and it's like a song going up to heaven. And God hears it as a song. It says, they'll sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. This is one of the greatest signs you'll ever see in this earth is God speaking prophetically to men in this earth, all over this earth with one voice. That can't happen any other way but God. Because I, what God speaks to me, what God speaks to someone in Arizona, what God speaks to someone in California, I don't even know these people. They don't know me. But when we see that we're speaking the same thing, when God's Spirit is moving and it's with one voice that He's speaking, you start to understand man couldn't organize this. Man couldn't orchestrate it. Men couldn't come up with it. They're not that smart. But God is almighty. He's omniscient and He's omnipotent. That means He can do anything He wants to do and He is moving in this earth right now. And so, when God speaks, you remember that pool of Bethesda. They would gather, people would hang out there. And it said once a year, an angel would come and trouble the water in that pool. And whenever that would happen, someone, whoever jumped in first got a healing, got a miracle. Because the water was troubled, they jumped into it, and boom, something happened. Now, every one of you is carrying a pool of Bethesda within you. Every one of you in your life, there are some still waters there in your life. And you're kind of, you like it. The fact that they're still, that they're calm. And yet, when God begins to speak in your life, and He begins to speak into your life, and He begins to raise His voice to you, and that can come just like it said there in Isaiah. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him that starts to bring good news, that publishes peace, that's bringing good tidings, that's saying things to Zion. Thy God reigns. Well, and people are troubled by what the turmoil is in the earth, and yet God is raising his voice because he is trying to trouble the waters in your spirit because there's deliverance coming. And he wants you to be ready for that. He wants you to be ready to jump in when he troubles that water. And it's the water of your spirit. And it's not like jumping into a lake. It's jumping deeper into God. It's, a, it's an agreement. It's a, it's a one accord in your life with God. You're, you're starting to hear him and feel his spirit and his presence. And you want that. You want that more than anything. What were we singing? What were you singing this morning? All I want is you. And when he starts to trouble the waters in your life, and many times that's what a prophetic voice will do, it will trouble things, it will disrupt things in your life. There's a calm that man likes to create for himself, and he likes it that way, he likes to have things a certain way, and then God will come along and speak a word, and it just upsets that apple cart altogether, and he's left thinking, well, what, what, where was I going? What was I thinking? What was I doing? Because God's coming along saying, son, there's more. My daughter, there's a life in God. There's something that you will learn when you know me. You see, there's a lot of wisdom out here in this earth. There's a lot of teaching out here in this earth. There's a lot of teachers out here in this earth. And every one of them's got a message. Every one of them's got something to say. There's hundreds of videos out there you can watch. There's hundreds of websites you can visit. There is such a glut of things out here in this earth that a man can listen to or choose to listen to. And I know what I'm talking about there because I did that for 40-some years. And you get to the end of that line and you think, what do I know? I can spit out scriptures. I can, I can spit out proof texts. I can convince anyone why they're wrong, what they think. I, I just, you just think, wow, I just know it all. But you know something? I didn't really know anything because I didn't know him. And when you come to that realization, does that mean that all that teaching was just wasted? No. 
Because it's the word. The word never returns void. But he's saying, you possess me. Let me possess you. And everything will start to make sense. You want to understand God's word? Meet him. How do you meet somebody? The best way is to walk up and introduce yourself to them. How do you do that with the Lord? Anywhere you want to. The Word talks about a prayer closet. Mine is the whole house because just me and her in there. And so I got a lot, 2,100 square feet to wander around anywhere I want to go in there and talk with him. And I do that. And I know she wonders sometimes what he's, who, who's he talking to? <laughs> because remember, she speaks Spanish as a primary language. So she hears me. She's not sure what I'm saying sometimes. But this is, this is what it's like. I consider him a friend. I have emptied myself in his presence more times than I can think of, of every burden that's on my heart. And I want him to know about it. I want him to be aware of it. I don't want to just carry it around. You realize some people are like, they, they just, I've seen pictures of people in the olden days when they'd carry stuff from one village to another. They'd have a yoke on their back and they'd be carrying it and it just weighed them down. The older they got, the harder that got to do. And Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me because my yoke is easy my burden is light and you and you come into his presence i mean intent on knowing him you know some people are harder to get to know than others this is this is something you learn in life there's some people that are what you call inscrutable you're just about to take a pickaxe to get anything out of them they don't want to answer. You, you ask them a question or you talk to them and everything's a one-word answer. They're just sitting there daring you to try and get to know them. And I'm glad that Jesus Christ wasn't that way. And I'm glad that when we go to him, he says, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He, God had perfect fellowship in the garden with Adam. You don't go naming the entire creation and organizing it and setting it up if there's problems. He had literally perfect communion with him that time, and they just operated as one. There was a unity. There was a flow. It was perfect. It was whole. And then Adam sinned. And when that happened, God lost that fellowship. He feels that. He has felt that ever since. And when he says he's going to have a people, when he says, I call you friend, I call you brother, you're not a servant anymore. The servant doesn't know what his Lord's doing, but the son does. When he speaks to you that way, he's saying, look, I want what I had. God put man over this whole creation. Everything in it was subject unto man. And when Adam broke covenant with the Lord, when he slipped up, immediately, I mean immediately, God is calling and saying, Adam, where are you? What was he saying? He said, buddy, what happened? We had a good thing going there. You and I, we were talking, we were working together, we were creating the whole earth. All this was going on, what happened? And Adam knew something had happened. That, you know, him and Eve went and they got some fig leaves and tried to cover themselves. And they never thought that way before. But that, that fellowship was lost there. So you want to put up that uh, picture? On the screen? Okay. Jeremiah, chapter 18. I went down to the potter's house. Now Potter's a guy that works with clay and he makes things and says he wrought a work on the wheels, plural. Two wheels. You see in the picture the clay on the little tiny wheel up there on top and he's working that with his hands but look where his feet are. That's like a small millstone at the bottom. And the reason that stone is big is to generate some momentum to turn the little one 
because the little one is where his hands are pressing on that clay and there's friction there that would stop the little wheel but if the other wheel's bigger so he's he's sitting there can if you can imagine that you're you're working with your hands like this and your feet are going back and forth the entire time to turn and yet you're still holding your hands steady working this clay and it's a real it's a real rhythm to watch nowadays they're electric and most potters will tell you they don't think about that but in those days where Jeremiah went down to watch the potter he was watching him work a work on the wheels because there were two of them and it says the vessel he made of clay it was marred it it you know he was I've I've actually watched a potter work and sometimes they're bringing the clay up and something just goes wrong and it goes flying off and the whole thing's a mess so what's he do <laughs> takes the clay and knocks it back down into a lump and start centering it again. And I knew a, a fellow who had once been a potter, and he said the most important thing when you're trying to make something on that wheel is the center of the clay. So if you got a wheel spinning, you got a lump of clay on it, if it's not in the very dead center of the wheel, you can put your hands on either side and you'll feel the movement of that clay trying to go one way or the other. And so the potter sits there like this, until the clay is literally rotating between his hands and he could move them away and it would stay there. Then he knows it's ready to work. That says something to a Christian about the will of God. There's a center. There's a center to God's will. There's a place in God where a man can change. There's a place in God where his hand can do something with you. It's on that wheel, but it's the center of the wheel. Because if you get either way, you're going to go flying off that wheel. So the work was marred. And that could have been a lot of different things that caused it to, to, to just flop apart. But he just matted it back down, centered it again, and it said he made another vessel as he saw fit. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and he said, O house of Israel, Oh, church in America. He says, can't I do with you what the potter did with the clay? He said, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The potter's wheel, it's the reshaping of our life. Getting on that wheel now that is something, that is a high form of agreement between you and God. If you want to get on that wheel, it's going to take a decision on your part. It, it, you know, the clay cannot, <laughs> if it's not centered, he can't work with it. And see, what was the potter doing? His feet. We're turning the wheel. What was the first verse that I read to you? How beautiful on the mountains are the feet. Why? A man's coming, he's preaching, but it says how beautiful are those feet. Because without the feet, the potter has nothing to work with. The feet turn the wheel. His hands work the stuff on the wheel, but his feet turn it. When you speak, thus saith the Lord, when you speak, I'm feeling Almighty God. When you speak, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me. When you speak, those feet carry you with that message. And you come into someone's life. Someone may hear what you have to say. And your feet are carrying a message to them. Your feet are starting the wheels turning in their life. When God talks about His watchmen raising a voice and making a song... 
That's the song that they're raising. That's the song that's being sung is that there's a place for you in God where His hand is upon you. If you humble yourself under that mighty hand, your life will never, ever be the same again because you have chosen to get on that wheel. Why? Because a sound came your way. Feet came marching. Feet came into your town. Feet came to where you were. Feet came bearing a message. Beautiful feet on the mountains of God speaking life, speaking peace. And those feet, you know, there's a woman, Mary Magdalene, in the New Testament. She's a mysterious woman to a lot of people. But she was no stranger to Jesus. And he was no stranger to her. Think of this woman. She had left her home where she was born. That wasn't a good thing to do, especially when you were young, because they figured, well, young women needed protection. They needed someone to keep an eye on them. She took off. She went to a town called Magdala, fishing village, kind of a rough town. And it had an effect on her, a pretty bad effect. She descended into a pretty degenerate life. She was one of the low lowlifes in the town she ended up in when she came back. Her life was pretty much a ruin. Her mental state was very unstable. People wanted nothing to do with her, and no one could control her. Here comes Jesus. Now I'm thinking, <clears throat> I think thinking there's a story in the Word that talks about them bringing a woman. They said, this woman was caught in adultery. And they throw her on the ground in front of the Lord. I think that was her. I was reading that one day and I just felt that so strong in the Spirit. He said, I want to show you something here. Just picture this woman as Mary Magdalene. This woman that they brought in. So she's laying on the ground, there's a mob surrounding her, and of course they all got rocks in their hands because they know what they want to do. They see something there that needs to be gotten rid of and they just want to find the quickest way to do it. And so they come, think of this, you know, think of a, think of a Black Lives Matter or Antifa or something like think of a mob like that coming to Jesus saying, hey, what do you think we ought to do? That's how weird that scene must have looked in that day. To think of something like that, an angry mob wanting to just wreak vengeance on this sinful woman, you know, this woman who dared to be in town and dared to be like she was. And what was Jesus doing? He came there and he stooped down and began to write in the ground. Now, why did he do that? Because she was laying there, she was laying in the ground. All she could see of him was his feet. She didn't even know him. Never, she probably had never seen him before. And there she lay. And these guys are all standing around her saying, the word says such should be stoned. What do you say? And finally he looked up at him and said, whoever is without sin among you, cast the first stone. And he went back to writing on the ground. One by one they all left. You know the story if you've ever read it. <clears throat> and finally, they were all gone, and he looked at her and said, no one's condemned you, huh? And she said, no man. He said, me neither. He said, go and sin no more. Shortly after this, another story in the, in the Gospels of a certain woman, again it says, certain woman. Jesus is in a Pharisee's house. And here comes a woman. And he's talking to the Pharisee and the Pharisee thinks this is cool. I got this pre Everybody's talking about this guy. I got him in my house. I'm talking to him. And while they're talking, this woman comes in the house with a an alabaster box of expensive ointment, breaks it over his feet and starts to wash his feet with her hair and her tears and the ointment. 
Now this was just totally out of line in that day for a woman to even touch a holy man, especially a woman like this one. But why was she doing it? She remembered those feet. She remembered those feet and she went right to them and she poured her heart out on those feet. What was she saying? How beautiful! The Pharisee was like, God, what's going on here? Doesn't he understand who that is? He was repulsed by it. And Jesus looked at him and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he told him about two debtors. One owed 500 pence, one owed 50. He said, the guy they owed money to forgave them both. He says, who's going to love him more? And he said, I suppose the one to whom he forgave the most. And he says, you have rightly spoken. And see, where does that come from? Who is the one with the greater debt. It's the one that understands he has a debt he can't pay. It could be any amount, but it's the one who understands without this man, I'm lost. And see, Jesus was saying, so here's this Pharisee. He said, I'm a Pharisee. I'm cool. I, I got it. You know, I'm set. But he said, Simon, you're missing the whole point of what's going on here. And there was another time that this happened too in Jesus' life shortly before he was crucified. But this event here was so significant because this certain woman, who I believe was Mary Magdalene, was expressing gratitude. And this time, Jesus, when she was, after he turned from Simon, he turned to the woman and he said, go in peace, your faith has saved you. He appreciated what was in her heart and she appreciated what he had done for her. The thing about Mary Magdalene, if you read the accounts in the Word where she shows up, she can't stay away from the feet of Jesus. The next time we see Mary is when he goes to Lazarus' tomb. Mary and Martha that's the Mary we're talking about here. And Martha goes out and says, oh, if you'd come, my brother wouldn't have died. You know, she was like, oh, if only you were here. And uh, he said, where's Mary? And so they send a message back to Mary and said, he calls for you. And it says she dropped everything and took off. Now, was, what's interesting is when she did that, there were a number of other people present where she was and when they saw her take off for Jesus they followed her because they they said there's something about her and him she has an understanding of him if she's taken off to be with him we're going to follow him and see what's going on here and she took off and said she came to Jesus and threw herself at his feet that was the first thing she did and wept over his feet and said, if you had been here, my brother had not died. Why did she say that? Because she knew that if he had not been there, she would have been dead. When you've been redeemed, it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Well, she said so and she knew it. No one could have talked her out of that. She knew what had happened to her. And it was real. And it was visceral. It was something that was very, very strong to her. And so she came and threw herself at his feet. You know the rest of the story. It says Jesus was troubled when he saw her again at his feet. It stirred something in her. It says he groaned in the spirit. And he said, where's Lazarus? And then the miracle happened. You say, well, did that make any difference? That she went... And did that? Yes, it did. When we let go of who we are and we throw ourselves at His feet and say, Master, how beautiful on the mountains are these feet. It draws something out of our God. You want to draw heaven? People talk about let's bring down heaven. Why not 
stir it up in you? Why not, why not open a door in your own heart and make a connection with God? Stir something in Him. Do you realize you can do that? We have the ability. God made us in His image. He made us for fellowship. And when we understand how we can connect with Him, we can provoke the Almighty in a good way. And this is powerful. And this is something that is in our nature. We were made for fellowship with Him. We were made for connection with Him. We were made to draw Him out. That's why when you go into your prayer closet to pray, you're not just sitting in there muttering empty words. You are pulling on the heart strings of heaven as you pray. That's what you're like is a giant harp in that room. And you're playing that thing. You're pulling those strings and they're making a sound. It's music. God's hearing the song. He's hearing the sound. He's hearing the voice of agreement reaching to Him, reaching to heaven, calling to Him, plucking at the heart, the very heart of God. Do you not think so? something's going to happen. You talk about power. You talk about getting distracted from what you thought you were going to preach today. But David talks about this in Psalm 51. He said, I was shapen. We would say today I was shaped in iniquity. Notice the, the word he used, shaped. Potter, the wheel, the clay. He said, in sin did my mother conceive me. He said, behold, thou desires truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. So he talks, he says, I was shaped wrongly when I came into this world. But what did the potter do when it was marred in his hand? He built another. He made another vessel as it seemed fit. And this is what God did with David. Look at how God used David. But he says, I was shaped. See, that's the thing about man. Man doesn't realize, yes, we were made in the image of God. But being born into this earth, you're shaped a certain way. You're fashioned a certain way until you come to Him. When you come to Him you can be on that wheel and be reshaped just like the potter did. And it's a wonderful thing when God begins to put his hands upon you and shape and mold and an image starts to take form on that wheel and something begins to appear that wasn't there before and your whole nature begins to change because he's shaping you on the wheel. And... Uh, Love is the only thing that's going to get you up there. It says of Jesus, and someone read this earlier, <clears throat> that he, who being in the form of God, okay, so that was a good shape, I would say. If he was in the form of God, that's a good shape to be in. And that's the shape, that is the form, that is the, the image that he was. He didn't think that it would be hard or something that he'd have to do illegally or something he'd have to circumvent to be equal with God. And so he emptied himself. He left glory. Gave it up. And came to earth. And it says, he took upon him the form of a servant, a shape. And was made in likeness of men. Now, Adam, God said, let's make man in our image. Adam was made in the image of God. Jesus, what image was he made in? Our image. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. He was made in the image of men. He became like us even though he was in glory. Now, to get an idea of how drastic the change was, you go to the book of Revelation when he appears to John. 
And John sees him in glory. Now this was the John that leaned on his breast, that walked with him, that always referred to himself as the one that Jesus loved. John would always refer to himself in third person. He'd call himself the disciple that Jesus loved. So he was close among the twelve. He was close to the Lord. And yet, when Jesus appeared to him on the island of Patmos, and he saw him in his glory, he said, I fell at his feet as dead. He could barely handle. He had seen a man, a good kind gentle man and then he saw this image of the glory that Jesus had possessed throughout eternity he said he left this to come to me (laughs) just the thought of it what it did to John I mean John, John was a wreck that was the first time he'd ever even thought about that and, and here he's looking right at the glory. He said, my goodness, I walked streets with this guy. I got my feet dusty walking alongside of him. I broke bread with him. We ate together. I stood at the foot of the cross while he was bleeding to death. He remembered all that. And the enormity, the enormity of the sacrifice that Jesus made hit him square in the face when he saw that glory. He won't ask you to do anything he hasn't done. He gave me a word about the narrow way. He said, it's only as wide as your vision. But he says, I've made room for you to move, even though it seems like a narrow way at times. He said, I will enlarge your vision and I will open up to accommodate the desires of your heart. So I open the way for others to follow. Someone has to blaze a trail. Are you willing to go somewhere in God that you've never seen anyone else go before? Are you willing to do something that doesn't have a precedent to it? Something that doesn't have a template? There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. The ultimate fear would separate you from God, but the ultimate agreement would put you so in love with Him that you'd go anywhere or do anything to be with Him. And there would be no hesitation on your part. You would have to go. You'd be compelled by what? Love. We have seen in 2020 what hate can do to people. We've seen the motivation of hatred and bitterness and rage. We've seen what it tears cities apart. It destroys everywhere it goes. But it's not a a fraction of the power of motivation that love can put in a man. Not even a touch. And so when he says someone has to blaze a trail... That's what it means to go into God's spirit, go into his realm, go into your closet, go in and start praying, talk to him, get to know him, but more importantly, make sure he gets to know you. Because he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I am known of them. It's two ways. There is no such thing as a one-way relationship. They usually don't go very far. And he said, it's a journey without template, without precedent. You and no one else in this world has passed this way before. Because the wedding, Cana of Galilee, the wedding had gone to its, almost to its end. And they came to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and said, they're out of wine. She looked at Jesus, he looked at her, he said, woman, it isn't time yet. She ignored him. She said to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Because he hadn't manifested himself in public at at that time. He hadn't done anything in the open. And so the water was made wine. 
They brought it out to the governor of the feast and he tasted it and said, where did this come from? He says, everybody's drunk. They don't save wine for that. The, the good wine, this is the good stuff. Where, where was this earlier? He knew something unusual had just happened because the best had been saved for the end of the ceremony. And he says that that's what he's getting ready to do in our day. Because this is a day that's not like any other day. And God says, I'm turning the water in you to new wine for my people. Expect hope. Expect heaven to open on your desire. The power that I've reserved for this time will be invested in those who have learned to love well. Love will set the world on fire. They haven't seen anything yet. Seek me. Find me. Search for me with your whole heart. He said, when I possess your heart, and you possess all of me, everything, the whole package, he's not part and parcel and the reason he can do that in this day and time is because God has a desire in this time like never before to be represented well in this earth and he is trying the hearts of men to see who he can trust who can he count on who will carry this message who loves him with everything they've got And I think about when Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, he said, why are you worried about clothing, raiment, what to put on, what to eat, how are we going to house ourselves? He says, you're worrying about these things. He says, the Gentiles. and, And by that he meant the nations of this world. They're outside of the kingdom of God. That's their obsession. That's all they think about. He says, but you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of this It'll be added unto you. It'll follow you. It'll overtake you. It's not, we're not, we're not out here on a get-rich-quick scheme. We're, on a, we're, we're seeking something much higher than that. And he says, when you set your souls and your heart and your desire on the kingdom of God, all of this gets added to you. Notice he didn't say, secondly, seek this. There's nothing listed as the second thing. That's something to think about. He just said, seek First, the kingdom. He says, and if your focus is right, he says, you'll never have to take thought for any of this. He says, why are you taking thought? You're taking thought because your focus is out of whack. You're not thinking about what's important. He says, learn what my burdens are. You know, in, in, in the days of old, the prophets would come, or the, 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 the religious leaders, they'd come to Jeremiah and say, Jeremiah, well, what's the burden of the Lord today? What, what's God thinking about today? He said, what do you care he says, you haven't cared about the burden of the Lord forever. Don't come to me and say the burden of the Lord. You don't even care about what he thinks about. Well, God's going to have a people in this day. That's going to be their passion. What's on his mind? I want it on mine. Whatever he's thinking about, whatever he's doing, I want to know, what he's, I want to know why he's doing it. I want to know why he wants me to do what he wants me to do. That's the kind of people he's fashioning on his wheel. In the Song of Psalms, it says, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. It said, if a man would give all of the substance of his house for love, it would be like nothing. Because when love gets a hold of you, nothing else matters. And anybody that's ever fallen in love knows what that falling in love experience is like. Your head is in a cloud somewhere. You can't think straight. And that's what God wants us to be consumed with, but in the Spirit of the Lord. He wants us to be so in love with Him that we wouldn't hesitate to move, no matter what He asked us to do, where He said to go. We would just go. Nothing else is going to matter. Heard that song, Nothing else matters but to be pleasing to God. Nothing else matters but to be walking with him walking in his spirit 
And it talks in Psalm 8, it says, what is man that you're mindful of him? What's the son of man that you visit him? You know, what? who's man? But what did God do? After all the creation, he said, now let's make man in our image because we need somebody to hand this over to. We need someone to, to, to have dominion here. So let's make man. And it says, you made him a little lower than the angels, but you crowned him with glory and honor. And you made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. Remember when Satan came to Jesus and said, hey, look, here's all the kingdoms of the world. Right here, see them? Showed them all, all of them. In a moment of time, it says. He says, all this power, I'll give it to you if you fall down and worship me. Because he says, you know, it was delivered to me. Now, some people read that and they say, see, God gave these governments of the world over to the devil. It's his realm and we don't have nothing to do with that. But who did God say he gave dominion to? It was man. Who gave it to Satan? Man did. Who's got to take it back? That's, that's what you're feeling. Because that's God's feeling, the longing for fellowship, the longing for communion, the longing for connection. And if you're feeling the burden of the Lord, you are feeling drawn into that. You're feeling, Lord, God, we've got to take dominion over the things around us. We have to take authority. We have it. It's in us. It's the way you made us. It's how we work. Now, what is love? What's faith? What's hope? What, what do they have in common? All three of them are a form of agreement, either between men and other men or men and God. If you have faith in God, then you say, yes, I believe what he said here in his word. I, I believe in that. I have faith in that. I will, I will act on that because God said it. It's his word. So I can believe it. I can do it. So that's an agreement. You make an agreement with God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have faith. Now, when you choose to hope, a lot of times when you're choosing to hope, you're, you're choosing to hope because something really ugly is in front of you that is not what you wanted as an outcome. And it's staring you in the face and you say, but my hope is in him. My hope is in him. Why? Because he has my heart. And when he got my heart, there was a hope planted in there. And regardless of what I see in front of me, I know that my God is faithful and I have a hope. So I agree with him that I have a hope. I agree with him that this isn't the end of things. I agree with him that things are going to get better because I'm going to hold fast to what he's put in me. So there's faith and hope. Powerful forms of agreement. But what is the highest form of agreement? Love. What makes a marriage work where the bride marriage won't work without agreement and love is the absolute highest form there is. When he says love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul all your might all your strength he's saying something there because this is power itself. When you release that agreement to God, there's so much turned loose right there. And he says in Matthew 18, he says, I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it will be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. What happens? when we agree nothing is impossible nothing and love is the highest form there is of agreement I have friends and I'm, I'm proud of every last one of them but I mean I have friends these days how do I know they're friends because we can get together number one we can agree to get together that's that's a big deal even there just to take the time out of your day and say hey let's spend some time let's talk let's just to do that. 
Anytime you gather together with God's people, you're making a choice of how you're spending time and what you're doing with your time. You're saying, I think this is important. Let's get together. Let's talk. Let's agree on some things. And you, you, you do that, and it says when two agree on earth as touching anything that they ask, it will be done for them of my Father in heaven. Because when two agree, talks in the word about if, if one be overtaken, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. Because when two agree, there's a third person in the room. And you can't get away from him. And this is the power of agreement. Agreement with God generates something else in the room. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not agree with the king. They would not agree to bow before the thing that he wanted them to bow before. They were agreeing with, they said, we're going to agree with Almighty God and we're not afraid of you or your furnace or any of your stuff. So he threw them in it. And what happened? It generated another guy in the room. I'm telling you. And that's just a parable there of the power of agreement. And love is the highest form there is. You say, I want to have faith in God. I want, to, I want to be a powerhouse in God. If you want to be a powerhouse in God, learn to love God. Learn to love well. Learn to love mankind. Learn what it means when Jesus said, I'll have mercy and not sacrifice. Learn what he means by these things because this is where the key to, to unlocking what he's trying to unloose in man right now, this is where it resides it's not in some great long-winded doctrine. It's in that when Jesus said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And what will the consequence of that be? You love your neighbor as yourself. And you learn how to do that because you're willing to love God with everything you've got. It's natural. It's natural. It's natural you become a living vessel out of which love flows. Water flows out of you. The Spirit of God flows through you. It's rippling through you. It's like a tide, like a riptide going through you. And it will draw anyone into him that gets close to it. That's what a riptide does. You get caught in one, it just pulls you under and drags you along. But when you're talking about the Spirit of God and you're talking about the love of God, it is powerful. There's a lot of things men can resist. One thing they can easily resist is an argument. They can always argue back. They can always, you got a doctrine, they got a doctrine. You got an opinion, they got an opinion. You got love, they have no answer. There is no answer for love. It's the most powerful thing in the world. And God says, I am love. God is love, and he that dwelleth in him dwelleth in love. That, why did John talk so much about this? Because he knew that he had been loved. You read the letters of John. You read the Gospel of John. You read Revelation. You get a picture of a guy that was so in love with Jesus that it had consumed his life. He had nothing else that was worth anything to him. But he had the one thing that was everything to him. Love never fails. Whether there be prophecies, they'll fail. We prophesy now. We hear the voice of the Lord. We distill it as best we can. We bring it forth. We get better at it. We do it more often. Tongues? Tongues will cease. We won't need tongues at some point. The more you, closer you draw to Him, There'll come a time when you don't need any of that. It says, whether there be knowledge, knowledge will vanish away. We know in part, we prophesy in part, we speak in tongues in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I sounded like one. I thought like one. I had the understanding of a kid. But when I became a man, what's that talking about? A child, when it's born, 
does nothing to earn the mother's milk. All he does is suck. It's there for him. It's provided. He doesn't have to do anything to get it. But remember, it talks about Abraham and Isaac, and it says, in the day that Isaac was weaned, Abraham made a great feast to celebrate it. Why? Because now, if Isaac wanted to eat, he was going to have to take the food himself. That's a big deal. You want the meat of the word? Who's got the meat? Ain't mom. Mom's got the milk. Who's got the meat? Who's the guy that would go out and bring the meat back? That's the father. You want the meat? Get to know the father. Get intimate with him. Talk to him. Let him talk to you. Listen. You realize you can listen in the spirit. People say, well, how do you hear God speak? I would walk around my house talking to him. I've done this so many times now, but I'd be talking to the Lord. I'd be telling him what was on my mind, and then all of a sudden I'd hear something come out of my mouth, and I'd stop walking because I realized it wasn't me. What I just said wasn't me. And he, he began to show me this because he said, he said, you're hearing from me and you think it's you and so you don't act on it, you don't share it, you don't do nothing with it. He says, quit doing that. He says, I'm speaking to you. I could be in the shop working on something and a thought pops in my head and I know it popped in my head because I wasn't thinking about that. It just pops in there and you think, okay, Lord, I hear you. And it can be audible you could see an open vision of something or you could see a picture in your mind of something that God's trying to show you and just brings clarity to it. It's powerful. Love. So it says, now abides faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest is love because when the other two are gone, the love remains. All of them are forms of agreement. Love's the highest. Just remember that. It's the highest form of agreement between man and God. When you're on the wheel with the potter, the clay really has nothing to do with it. It's willing, you're willing to let the hand of the potter... What is the hand of the, of the potter, really? in your life today it's the word how the word comes to you the feet bring the word to you the beautiful feet they bring the sound the song of God's word into your life and that word is there that hand of the Lord is there in your life looking to shape you looking to conform you to a much better image than the one you were born with my desire our desire, God spoke about this house. And it's not just for this house, but he did speak it specifically for this house. He said there's going to be many. They're going to come in, and then they're going to go out. What are they coming in for? Something more? Something in God? Something they need in their life? Something they're missing in their life? Or maybe they just like the fellowship, but they'll be coming in, They'll be getting fed, and they'll be going out, and others will come in, and they'll get fed, and they'll go out, and this will become a pattern in the body of Christ. Why? Because the gifts that are in the church are there for one reason, and that is to train the saints for the work of the ministry. If you think that the gifts in the church are so a few people here and there can do all the work, you are sadly mistaken. You don't understand the heart of God and what a body is, what an organism is. God has given gifts in the church for one reason, so we can duplicate them in every one we come in contact with. That's why he gives them. I tell you something. I, had, I played guitar since I was 18. I was probably 35 years down that road, and two of my grandkids said, Hey, could you teach us guitar, Grandpa? I hadn't been playing much, and I thought, Goodness. 
I mean, I said yes, but I got home and I started thinking, what do I actually know about the guitar? And I had to think about it. Because until I realized what I knew, I couldn't teach them. See, they wanted to be taught. And I thought, well, I know how to play guitar, but do I know it well enough to teach them? You have a calling? You got a gift? Something God wants you to do? How well, how well do you know it? How well does it register in you? Could you teach it to somebody? Could you duplicate it in another man's life or another woman or one of your children or one of your grandchildren? Would they understand what you were talking about? Could you communicate it that clearly? This is what it's for. It's not there for any other reason. It ain't, God didn't just, just decide, you know, oh, gee, I'm just going to pile it all on him and let him figure it out and sort it out. No, it wasn't quite like that. It's there for a reason, and it's to bear fruit. Isaiah says, remember not the former things. Don't consider the things of old, because I'm doing a new thing. Now it's going to spring forth. And he says to the church, shall you not know it? Are you going to recognize it? When I begin to move, when I begin to work, when I begin to do the thing that I want to do, he says, shall you not know it? It's going to be new. You won't be able to go back in your mind and think, where did I see this before? He says, no, I'm doing a new thing. But shall you not know it? Are you keen? Are you listening? Do you have faith in God? Do you love Him? Will you know it? We need to know it. He says, I'll make a way in the wilderness. I'll bring waters and rivers in the desert to make a way for my people. Think about that. He says, I'm going to make ways for my people that are not apparent right now. They're not visible. They're not the ways they have known. I'm going to create new way. Why? Because there's an overflow. Right now in the church of God, there are many, and I, and, and I, I know I'm speaking for my generation when I say this, I'm 67. There is an overflow in many of us. We are literally so full of the of scriptures and teachings and doctrines and things we've heard and experiences we've had. We are literally busting at the seams and yet we don't know what to do with it. And God says, I am going to make a way in the desert. That means the desert or the wilderness, that's where God's people are in a wilderness experience, trying to sort out their own lives, trying to make sense of things, trying to find a direction. He says, I'm going to send you, you're going to be a way. You want to be a way? You want to be a way maker? We can be a way maker. We can actually be a pathway. We can be a conduit for the Spirit of God to move through us. But we, more than that, it can provide a way for someone, someone that wants something from God, someone that has lived their whole life wondering, what's it all about? What's it mean to me? What's it going to do in me? And he says, I'm going to make ways in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Jesus said, out of your belly is going to flow rivers of living water. You're going to be a river in the desert. You're going to be the feet turning the wheel. You're going to... God wants to use His people to do things they've never thought or seen themselves doing. But He's laying it out in His Word right now. He's laying it out to a people who are willing to hear it. Ephesians says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus, what? Unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I will make a way in the wilderness. I will bring rivers in the desert. He has ordained these works 
that we should walk in them. I don't know about you, but this excites me. This gets me going. This, this is the kind of thing that keeps you up at night. I mean in a good way. Where you just can't roll over and go to bed because there's some, something else on his mind and it's on your mind. And so you're thinking about it. What's he want from me right now? What's he calling me to do? What's he calling you to do? What are you feeling? Think about these things. These are, these are the times we live in. This is a different time in the earth right now that we are living in. God is provoking us to something. He is reaching out his hand. He is pouring out his spirit. He is saying, can you hear the call? Can you feel the pull? Some of you have been hearing the word for 40, almost 50 years. What are you feeling? What are you hearing? What's pulling on the strings of your heart, your harp? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Just raise your hands to the Lord in this room. Open up your heart. Remember, if He can possess your heart, you can possess everything he's got. Everything. The windows of heaven can open on you if you let him have his way. God, touch. It's a time, this is a time to rend your heart, not your garments. Appearances don't matter to him. Rend your heart. Open your heart. In Spanish, it would be something like Abre la puerta de su corazón. Let the Lord, the knocker, he's the knocker, he's always knocking on doors. Think about some of these door-to-door -door salesmen that would spend their whole life, with all they do is knock on one door after another trying to make a sale. Here's God, he says, I stand at the door and knock. Have you ever answered the door to one of those salesmen just wish they'd go away? One thing about Almighty God is He doesn't go away. He comes back again and He knocks again. Because He's going to keep on knocking. It's just going to keep on knocking. That phone's going to keep on ringing. That string is going to keep being pulled. There's nothing... If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, there's nowhere you can go to get away. You can't go up into heaven and get away. You can't go down into hell and get away. You can't go under the earth. You can't go into the sea. You can't go out into heaven. Into the, there's nowhere to go where you can run away. For Just ask Jonah. There's nowhere to go. He wants you. He's calling you. He is reaching out His hand right now to you. If you can take it, will you take it? Will you go with Him? Will you make a commitment to Him? What, is it, what are you looking for right now in this day and time? Where have you been? God is calling you. Where are you? He's like going through the garden again. Back in the 60s and the 70s, they were singing songs about we've got to get ourselves back to the garden that was actually a heart cry of Almighty God. They didn't know it. But I was, I was hearing something, a song from back then, and I heard that line in that song, and God was saying, I am calling man back to fellowship with me like we had there in the beginning, 100% clear, nothing in the way. I am calling man to a communion and a walk with me. And his hand is reached out. It says the hand of the Lord is not short, that it can't save. His ear is not dull that he can't hear. He is not tuning you out. He said, you've been tuning me out. He says, tune me in. Hallelujah. Let it fall. I'm telling you, let it fall. Let the Spirit of God have his way. Let him in. Let him in. It doesn't matter to him how long it's been. Let him in. Let him in. Let him touch you.
It's all he's ever wanted. It should be all you've ever wanted. I think, I think there's an awakening happening in the church in this day and time we're living in. And God is not going to rest. He said, he said give him no rest till he establish and make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Are we to be quiet? Are we to be passive about this? Are we to be driven like no man has ever been driven to accomplish any goal in history, no matter what the obstacles were? Are we on the course here of something greater than has ever been done in this earth? I think we are. I think we are. And I don't think he'd be calling us to this if we couldn't do it, saints. I don't see God that way. There's nothing in his word that he's put before us that's beyond our reach. Because his hand is outstretched. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's a time to humble yourself. You know, he gave me a song years ago about the potter's wheel. And one line of that song was, If a man, therefore, will humble himself under the mighty hand of God, his life will never be the same again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Just let him minister to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just love the feeling of his presence. I love the way his word and his presence work together. When his presence comes, it enlightens the word. It opens up the word. The word that you'd read a hundred times suddenly just jumps off the page and right into your heart. And you say, well, where's that been all this time? You feel it. You know it's real. Some of you are like wells. Deep, deep wells. There's so much water in there. God is wanting to draw it out. Jesus met that woman at the well, that Samaritan woman, and she was lowering a bucket down, one bucket at a time, drawing water up. And she was at the well by herself, by the way, because other people didn't want to be there when she was there. She found that out when she tried to go in the morning when all the other women were there, and they said, they just left. They didn't want to be with her. And she knew, okay, I can't go when they're there. I'll have to go by myself. Well, you know the Son of God saw her there. <laughs> and he left his disciples and said, i got to talk to this woman. But he didn't tell them what he was going to do. He went to the well. And he said, could I have a drink? Think of that. Does Jesus come to you and ask for a drink? Do you know you can refresh the heart of God? It's true. And Jesus was there at the well, and she looked at him and said, you're asking me for a drink? He said, he said, she said, like, hey, reality check here. You, Jew, Jerusalem, me, Samaritan, ugly, hated. She said, what's wrong here? What's going on? He said, woman, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink. He said, and I'd give you a kind of water, living water, he said it would start springing out of you and you'd never be able to stop it. All of those stories and the words, I mean, they seem so simple. But the depth of what Jesus was trying to communicate to that woman is right here in this room right now. He's trying to communicate it to you. He's saying, give me a drink. How do we give him a drink? We open up our hearts to him. We say, Lord, we're full. Make a way, Lord. Make a way, I want to let it out. You let it out, he pours it in. You let it out, he pours it in. He says, I'll give you water and you'll never thirst again. But I'm telling you something, it's a different kind of thirst because once you've tasted that water, you're going to be going back for more and you're never going to get tired of seeking that water. It's going to consume you. Oh my. Oh my. 